recycle or waste tests. Uh, the things we think to say or do is the truth. Is it fair or all concerned? Will ill goodwill and better friendships will be beneficial to all concerned? Like Byron, the volunteer medic, who 
selflessly treats the injured and his fellow refugees. Families have created mountains out of shisha pipes, with static breathing versions of growing plants and creating artwork to remind them of love. Their kids can stop growing graphic images of war. Aren't we with that? It's now I found myself here in the of the old farm, looking around and seeing each other back up on the dance. Something like the United Nations Refugee Agency will be needed if the kind of monstrous things that are happening in Syria today won't happen. I wish they won't happen. But I'm glad to be part of the family of humanity. Because when we do what family does best, which is look after each other, we do it right. And seeing what's happening camps has made me realize that sometimes we do do it right. Civilizations take the thing. The people at the meeting live normal, boring, dull lives. They own shops, they have factories, they work in factories, they sow things, they eat glass. And now they don't have anything. And they're building all that up. Here are the volunteers. You see my son there too. Um, there are lots of volunteers in the camps. These people need something to do. The average stay at a camp is 17 years. So there are volunteers within the camps who are working within the projects. Worldwide, there are 65 million refugees. If you take a look at what that means exactly, that's the size of Great Britain. That's how many people have left their homes because they felt unsafe. Each day, there are 34,000 people leaving their homes as refugees. So if you add that together, that's the population of Lytton and Lebanon, Pennsylvania, that are fleeing their homes. 87% of these people are living in poverty. What's interesting is these people were middle class people who owned businesses, who were like us, but just because of where they lived and what was going on there. So what is a refugee? It's someone who's leaving their country because they fear for their lives. Um, politically, religiously, there are many, many things that make someone flee. Um, additionally, you could be an internally displaced person. There's a lot of that in Iraq, where people are leaving Mosul and going to Erbil. So they're within the same country. And when we were there, we were in Erbil. It's about 30 miles from Mosul, uh, as the crow flies, to drive with so at no time did we feel in danger, and we were there before the fighting began. Yeah. All right, this is a map of the conflict area. Probably many of you have seen this before. Uh, in the red, you can see where ISIS is, and this is areas where there's no government infrastructure, no provisions of any services that isn't done by ISIS itself. So they're the de facto government in the red. We were in the TAM region at the top. We were in Kirkuk over here, and Erbil is right here. Um, those regions are where the refugee camps are. They are at border Turkey and Iran, and they militarize their borders, so people can't go into the TAN area from Turkey or Iran unless they're defecting to ISIS. This is the larger area. When you look at this map, you see Syria and Iraq again where the conflict zone is. But around that area, the border of Turkey, Iran, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and Jordan, and Lebanon, and Israel, 
all militarize their borders so no one can leave the country and come in. Uh, there is one spot on the Jordanian border where all the refugees must go if they want to enter. You can't go anywhere else or the government will shoot you. So a lot of people have to walk for hours carrying everything they can just to get to that one spot. Your only other option then, if you don't want to stay in Syria or Iraq in the Tam region, or go to the one spot in Jordan, is to get in a boat and leave. This is Aleppo. It's a beautiful town. It has a beautiful history. It's one of the national landmarks, worldwide landmarks from UNESCO. But right now, it doesn't look like that. It looks like that. And I'm sure all of you have seen little Amran Times, the Wall Street Journal. This dear little boy lived in Aleppo, and this boy had to flee. He was probably going to be in a camp. His brother died. His home was destroyed. But that's where he left. And most of these people, the stories we heard, they were walking for days. They start out in their car, and then they hit a checkpoint, and they have to leave. They have to leave their car. They have to leave everything. If they stay, terrible things. Be shot if you're a man. If you're a woman, you are taken as a sex slave, and these women are sold back and forth many times. After a period of time, for six thousand dollars, you can buy back the old and unattractive women, but you're certainly not getting back the woman you left. And if there's a child, they would take the child as a child soldier. So who are they? Surprisingly, yes, they're Muslim. Also, Christian. They're people who have any political affiliation that disagrees with, with what's going on in their country. And it uh, could be religious, could be ethnic. The other thing is Christians. This is the Arabic letter N. When ISIS went into Mosul, they put this on the Christians' doors. This letter N, which means Nazarene, follower of Christ. If they stayed, So they had to leave, and they had less than 24 hours to get out of the town. The United Nations High Commission on Refugees was formed in the 50s. These, um, the United Nations High Commission on Refugees runs all the camps. They provide the tents, they provide the support, but at the camps there are many, many charitable organizations, Knowledge Without Borders, World Vision, USAID, UNICEF, Samaritan's Person, many, many charities, and each have a function at um, the camps, which really makes it quite unified and almost like a little city. Water is one of the main functions that World Vision provides at the camps. They need water to bathe, they need water to cook, they need water to just live. And, and what you have is five or six tents or little units, and then you'll have a cook stove, water, and the ability to so World Vision comes in and provides the water. It also provides the water to surrounding communities, if there are any surrounding communities. Um, they provide water as well because they don't want the surrounding communities to feel the uh, animosity toward the refugee. How do they get to the camp? Andrew touched on this. There are three options. You can walk or travel to another country. Then you'll be living in poverty. 86% of those people are living in poverty. 20% of those people, even at the camps, are going to school. Um, you could depart on a boat, a dinghy, and risk your lot, your life. And you, again, you pay a smuggler a lot of money to do this. Or you could go to a camp and you stay in a camp for a minimum of 17 years. That's the, the average. Um, the rate of returning home is the lowest it has ever been. 1% of the people currently are returning. Less than 1% of the people are, are going to the United States. And in the camps, there's a lot of vetting. So a 1,000 new people come to the camps every day, and they are held in a staging area. And they have to be cleared before they're allowed into the camp. So if there's any association with ISIS or any other radical group, they are sent back to where they came from. It's a little video on the boats. <laughs> The refugees often to leave as if from nowhere, frighteningly low in the water, 
sneaking from left to right, looking for a place to land. It's six kilometers. A window of flat, calm water with no wind is seeing a mad dash of him into the straight from Turkey to Greece. Six kilometers to sanctuary. As they approach the shore, we can see the panics that are set on their faces. These are families with several young children. This will be the fifth boat that has come in this morning from just over there in Turkey. Another overlaying and inflatable thing being steered by one of the refugees themselves. Scared and dizzy, they fall over each other to get out. If anything, despite having made it, the planet seems to be rising. Their only help comes from a couple of tourists and volunteers on the beach as they all stumble over the rocks. They have come so far from Syria across land through to Turkey across this final stretch. And this is the moment they reach Europe and suppose security. Where from? Iran? Syria? Syria? Where is Syria? Aleppo? Egypt? How long have you been traveling? A long time. A long time. To take care. 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 To take Laura Ferris is spending a holiday helping those coming in on the boats. Do you think about all the Brits back home saying, I'll take them with you? If they met some of these people that come off the boats and listen to the heartbreaking stories, they change their opinion. Kinds of things you hear. Terrible. There was one man um, and his wife and his wife. With a 21 day old baby and a one year old little boy with hydrocephalus, and they made that journey from Aleppo because they didn't want their children growing up to the sound of bombing, and they were willing to make this treacherous journey. Everyone starts walking without any real idea of where they're heading, and the locals descend on the boats, scuppering the dinghies and taking the reusable parts and the valuable engines. It's 40 miles to Mussolini where they must register. Along the way, as it sinks in, they remember to call their relatives to say, We're alive, we made it. Gius <laughs> tells his brother in Saudi Arabia that they are all happy to Germany. As they got to the bus stop, you could see the exhaustion setting in with Gius' family. It came with a huge relief. What is it you want for your family? I hope my kids will go to school and that my older children can join us. We want to return to normal life in Syria. After months making the war, the Greeks have now become buses. They still have days and weeks of waiting, travelling and marching ahead. But they're out of the war zones and enjoying the moment. We have a thousand people travelling last year to get to Europe, to Greece and Italy, 3,700 of them died. So it's a very treacherous thing to try to do that to get to safety. These are three boys who went on a field trip. We met them the first day we went to one of the camps. These boys needed to go to an airport to see that airports, uh, airplanes transported people, not bombs. These boys probably have some type of PTSD because every time they hear a door slam, they think they're being shot at. Now, half of the refugees are children and women, so you can imagine you know, how many stories we have like this. School is the most important thing to these kids. When we ask them, what did you do when you left? What did you take with you? They said, I took my pencils, my books, my diploma. Education is so important. But there are so many people at the they can only go to school for two hours a day, so they have three sessions of two hours a day at the camps. 
when we went to, when I've been to Africa, they sing for you when you visit the community. Here, what they were happy to do is recite to us. They, they gave us a little um, play on hand wipe on washing. They also read to us in English. They were all very proud of what they were learning. World Vision also runs the playgrounds, and these kids, as you can see, are waiting in line. Each child has to wait in line. Again, it's a two-hour window that they're able to play every day. There's three sessions, two hours in. Here's a picture again of what they can do during the day. This is little doggy who waited 20 minutes to use this word. This, this is unfathomable to me. I mean, one of the things in reviewing all this saying to myself, you know, we as Americans appreciate our freedom. We, we love that we have the ability to choose. These people have lost that. They can't choose where they live. They can't choose what they do, where they eat, when they eat, what they eat. It's just they lost their ability to choose. Um, World Vision also runs a soccer team on the camps. These men need something to do. Most of them do volunteer during the day, but they also have soccer this is the soccer player. They travel for six days by foot to get to this camp. I mean, and every family we met has a story like this where they really struggled to get to where they needed to be, but they had hope and they continued on. We're being addressed to these because of their Christian faith. If you can be 73, takes a closer look. I will never imagine he'd have to start all over again as a produce clerk. In Mosul, Iraq, he owned a restaurant, liquor store, and his own home. But when the ISIL edged close to his town, they issued a decree, convert to Islam, pay monthly tariffs, and help kill non-compliance or face death. He fled at 5 o'clock. By 7, ISIL fighters had taken over Mosul. Mosul. We saw what happened to neighbors. They paid the money, and a few days later, ISIL killed them anyway. ISIL is typical of the 4,000 Christians who began fleeing Iraq for Jordan last August at a rate of 250 per day. Jordan's newest urban refugees, they are affluent and educated and work menial jobs to get by. When they finally make it to Jordan, this Catholic church is the destination point for most of the thousands who have come here. It's here that they don't have to worry about persecution from ISIL, and they know they'll get help. They often settle in Christian neighborhoods close to churches. They have run from ISIL, but know the threat is still close by. I have a we are surrounded by ISIL, Jabhat al Nusra, and our extremists. So Jordan also faces danger, but we rely on our faith and trust our king and military. In the face of that threat, Iraqis, unlike Syrian refugees, hope little hope of returning home. Iraq. There is no more Iraq. It's finished. There's nothing to go back to. Stephanie Free, CCTV, Full Heights, Jordan. There are 120,000 Christians that have left Mosul and mostly moved into Jordan and are staying at parish houses. This is Father Daniel. Father Daniel houses 120 families on his church property. And there's a picture of Father Daniel with the children. And this might be a video. Big gap between faith and fear. So I 
told them that I'm going to stay. On the next day, seven to August, I went out the church and I had found so many families. They were just shocked and they were crying because they had lost everything. This is Jordan. This was the second country we went to. Uh, you can see the capital of Oman. We went to Zarqa refugee camp right outside of Oman. It has 150,000 official refugees. That doesn't count people that sneak into the camp or the babies that have been born there over four years that no one can keep track of. When you look at this map, you can see the border of Syria, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia, which is on the horizon. And the one spot on the northern part of the border is where families would have to go to get it. Jordan originally uh, started, was known for accepting refugees in the 40s on because that's what the Palestinians would flee to. So when you go to Oman, there's whole regions of the city that were built out of refugee camps and just became urban suburbs eventually. So being there, we were there in uh, 
May of 2014, and the refugees started coming in August of 2014 in waves. So we saw right before the crisis happened, and two years later, and just in two years, there was a great change. Yeah, so we went to Jordan twice. Um, first before all this happened, and then again, next slide. This is Father Jar. He is in Jordan, and he is another priest who's working with trying to keep them safe, they ended up in his parish house. He was captured in Baghdad um, for three days. He was, he was uh, taking children from the hospitals and bringing them home because no one was claiming them, and he was kidnapped. Another thing about Father Jar, uh, his bishop, the Bishop of Jordan, uh, really does not like the refugee crisis, and he thinks that it's besmirching his country. So he refuses to give them official aid because he wants the crisis to end and things to go back to normal. So he thinks the best way to do that is to refuse it. So Father Char is going against the wishes of the Bishop of Jordan by setting up this camp. Here's their, next one. Here's their living conditions. Here's their living conditions. There are sheets that divide the rooms. This woman is looking for her husband. This man has no idea where his family is. This woman has two disabled children. So, in summation, you know, what we learn is that refugees are just like us. Um, when we label them, we're dehumanizing them. We're actually taking away their stories. We're taking away their names. And, and that shouldn't be the case. What's amazing is, you all get it. I mean, here's the New York Times Christ, uh, Christmas Day talking about 